A very good morning to one and all present here. On this blissful occasion, we are glad to have with us Professor Nicholas Kazanas, a renowned scholar of Vedic studies. Professor Nicholas, born in Greek island of Chios, has excelled in English literature from the University College, London, Economics and Philosophy from the School of Economic Science, London, and Sanskrit from the School of Oriental and African Studies, London. Apart from this, he has also done his post-graduation at SOAS and at Deccan College in Pune. He taught in London and Athens and since 1980 has been a director of Ominos Militant Cultural Institute. He is on the editorial board of Adia, Library Bulletin at Chennai. And also he has produced a three-year course of learning Sanskrit for the Greeks. He has done a research comprising thorough examination of Indo-European culture and has also translated the ten principal Upanishads, Isa Vashi Upanishad, Keno Upanishad, Kato Upanishad, Mandukya Upanishad, and Brahadanyaka from the original Sanskrit text into Greek. Currently, he is on a promotional tour for a new world-class peer-reviewed academic journal to be edited by him, named Vedic Venues, Journal of the Continuity of Vedic Culture. We feel very proud to have a multifaceted personality with us today, and we extend a very warm welcome to you. I request our secretary to welcome Professor Nicholas with a flower. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to speak to you about the elements of the Vedic civilization as far as I understand them and also their relevance to modern life. Uh, I shall start by defining first or at least describing what I and some other people think civilization is. I shall then examine the elements in the Vedic tradition and particularly the Rig Veda and the Upanishads, which is my special area of expertise, and then proceed to um, see how they relate, if they do, to modern life. Now, the word civilization, I shall use the word civilization, culture, and tradition in much the same meaning, although I'm fully aware that there are differences, different nuances, but for the purpose of this lecture it doesn't really matter very much. The word civilization has been defined variously um, by different sociologists, anthropologists, philosophers, and so on. There are two sides to it. One side uh, speaks of technical advancement, large buildings, uh, tools for the various crafts, uh, weapons of war, and so on. And these are things that one can measure and uh, examine. And archaeologists love to discover such things underneath the ground. And that's fine. But is that really the essence of civilization, large buildings, aeroplanes, steam engines, and uh, devastating weapons of war. Is that the essence of civilization? I don't think so, and many others don't think so either. There is an inner side to civilization as well, a psychological side or spiritual side, if you like. Now, the word civilization comes from a Latin word, which is there, uh, civis, civis means a citizen, civilis means being civil, and civitas is a city. So, civilization for the Romans was ordered life in the city as distinct from the disordered life unmeasured life, irregular life of nomads that roamed about in the Roman Empire. The Greeks used to call them barbarians and so do we call them uh, similarly today. The distinction between the ordered life in the city itself and the barbarians 
is as follows. People in the city took into consideration the fact that other people also live in the city in the same society. Barbarians do not take that into consideration to the same extent or in the same way. To barbarians, other people are an opportunity to uh, rob, kill, violate. Barbarians were regarded as rapacious, uncultured people. And indeed, today, when we speak of a civilized man, that's exactly what we mean. A man who takes into account the fact that other people are, are alive around him, is civil towards them, um, takes them into account, uh, uh, has regard for their health and their well-being, and so on. And the cultured person is very much the same, plus the fact that a cultured person takes an interest in the doings and uh, ideas of other nations and other cultures. Whereas uncivilized, uncultured people are people who are rapacious and do not take into account and do not treat with civility other people. Well, that's what we think of a civilized man or a cultured man today. The next one. Plato, in his Republic and later on in his Laws, delineated an ideal society, the beginnings of an ideal society, what's called Republic. But it's a misnomer because really what Politia, the, the word he uses, means just people living in a city. Polis means city. It's cognate with the Sanskrit word pur, or pura, and puram. Now, the four elements are simple agriculture and animal husbandry, simple essential crafts and exchanges, trade, in other words, with neighboring communities, feeding on barley bread and bulbs, and drinking moderately some wine. Then, spare time singing hymns to the gods. Now, this is very much like what one finds as life in the Rig Veda. They had exactly the same things. And you know the Rig Veda are hymns, songs, chants to the gods. Next one, please. Yoshinori Yosuda is a Japanese professor of um, archaeology, a very great scholar. Now, he examined the Jomon culture in Japan, which goes back to the 11th millennium, 11th millennium, 10,000 BC. And he comes up with certain conclusions about these people who lived very simply on rice, and had very, very simple, a very simple way of life. And he says that as far as they are concerned, they had respect for and coexistence with nature, proper relationship in accord with the features of the given region. That is to say, they took into account the environment and tried to live in accord, in harmony with that environment something that we don't do today, as you're probably aware. We pollute our environment most atrociously. Then Anthony West, a Egyptologist, in examining the civilization of Egypt of the third millennium BCE, wrote, in civilization, men are concerned with inner life to master greed ambition and envy. Now, the next one, please.
Can we say that modern nations are civilized? Because what we find is that there is great cupidity, great injustice, great selfishness and similar negative qualities. Now the film that we saw a little before is obviously an attempt to reverse this dreadful progress. But not many such organizations exist in the world. The vast majority and governments are really intent on precisely cupidity, fraudulence, injustice, all motivated by great selfishness, to grab and accumulate wealth for oneself rather than serve the community. Then we find are modern nations in harmony with the environment when they pollute it so severely? We shall examine one good example here in India of great pollution. Are they concerned to master greed, envy, ambition, selfishness? Well, the answer is no, really. The modern trend is to rush here and there and really grab as much as possible, have a career, but not just a career, but also to be above everybody else and gain as much wealth as possible and enjoy as much as possible at the cost of other people. Now, the Rig Vedic culture, which I mentioned before, is a non-material culture. It is not like the Maltese culture of the 5th millennium BCE. In Malta, if you ever go there, you will find great temples with megaliths. Very awe-inspiring, but they are very material. If you go to Egypt, you will find the huge pyramids, again awe inspiring, very large temples at Luxor and Karnak. And if you go to Mesopotamia, you will find great ziggurats, step pyramids, reaching up to heaven. Now, the Rig Veda is not like that. It is a monument in words, in oral tradition. The Indus Sarasvati civilization or Harappan culture has building, statuary and many artifacts, tools, seals and weapons. But the Vedic tradition itself is oral and this continues down to the Upanishads, the Sutra texts and the epics and as you know this tradition was very much alive, and it probably is in some places even today, up until the 20th century. In fact, European scholars used to come here and sit outside the house of the pandit while the pandit was reciting the holy texts and they were busy writing them down. And that's how they learned about this glorious Vedic culture. Next one, please. What is the axis? What is the central idea, the basis of Vedic civilization, the Vedic tradition? Well, obviously, there is a desire for happiness, for health, wealth, and heaven. This you find in many hymns in the Rig Veda, you find it in Yajur Veda, you find it in Atharva Veda, you find it in the Brahmanas. But beneath it all, there is the idea of divinization, or as we call it today, self-realization. Atma Jnana or Brahma Vidya. So that as it is expressed in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, Aham Brahmasmi, a full realization with one's whole being 
that I, this embodied creature here, is in fact, in his true self, no different from the self of the universe, the mystic spirit which is called Brahman. This is one aspect. The other aspect, again, is in the Isha Upanishad, or rather various other areas. Yastu Sarvani Bhutani Atmanyeva Anipashyati Sarvabhuteshu Chatmanam Who sees all creatures in himself and himself in all creatures. This is the man of self-realization. This is the man who really has Atman Jnana or Brahma Vidya. And this was the underlying theme in the Rig Veda hymns. Not many people realize this because they get caught up in the adventures of Indra, in the various exploits of Vishnu and so on. And they forget that beneath it all there is the one. Can we go to the next one? In Rig Veda, uh, one mandala, uh, the first mandala, 164 hymn by Auchatya Dirgha Tamas, a very great poet, very, very great poet. Now he says in stanza 25, he first talks about the two birds sitting on the same branch, one is eating the sweet fruit and the other is watching, and then he says, where the birds are, Ino Vishwasya Bhuvanasya Gopa Sama Dhira Pakam Atra Avivesha. Now, the first thing that struck me when I read this hymn was the humility of this great poet. He calls himself Paka, a simpleton, not well educated. In fact, he says somewhere, a chikitvan, chikitushas chid atra, kavin prichami vidmane navidvan. I, who have not realized, ask the great poets who have realized in order to know, because I don't know. And yet, this man could speak with great authority about the six dimensions of the universe the three dimensions of time and the three dimensions of space. 